Karnak Temple. And this is probably, I would think, where the whole concept of baptism began. Look at this one. This is from the tombs of the nobles in Luxor. Just a beautiful piece. Look at how these sisters are wearing their hair. Happy to be nappy. These are Africans in fighting postures. I think they're Africans in fighting postures at a place called Medinet Habu. This is in the deep south. This is on the west bank of the Nile in Luxor. This is my favorite part of Kemet. A lot of sisters and brothers from the United States, they like Aswan. They love Nubia. Some folk like uh, Cairo because the pyramids, or Hormakit, the Steppe Pyramid, the temple, the tomb of Tahotep, uh, the Cairo Museum are all there. But Luxor is my spot. Luxor is important to me because that's where 80% it's been estimated, at least, that's where 80% of all the monuments of ancient Kemet are located there. 80%. That means a significant portion of all the antiquities in the world are located there. And there's a temple complex called Medinet Habu. And you see brothers in martial arts postures, or fighting postures anyway. This is just a beautiful piece I took from a cruise ship on the Nile, Sunset on the Nile. And if y'all haven't been to Kemet, you need to go. <laughs> It's a sacred place. For many people, and I don't mean any disrespect, uh, Mecca is the holy man, or it's the object of pilgrimage. And for many people, especially Christians, maybe it's Jerusalem. For me, it's Kemet. Yes, and I think that Kemet is a place that every African in the world should endeavor to go to at least once. you would never be the same. Now, I put off going for a long time. I was doing all these lectures on ancient Egypt and people began to challenge me and they began to say, but have you been there? And I would get defensive and sometimes even lie and say, yes, I've been there. And one of the stories I used to tell is my mother was born in Kenya. I would go there as a child and visit her. So I had never set foot on African soil. And then I went. And every positive thing that I, you know what I'm talking about, that I ever wanted to believe just manifested itself. I was so high, naturally. When I came back from the United States, as God is my witness, the first talk I gave when I uh, came back to Kim, I actually thought I levitated off the ground. <laughs> it's a special place. So go when you can. Sunset on the Nile, Taharka. Dr. John Henry Clark said gave us our last great walk in the sun. Uh, I've been hearing about it for some time, and now it looks like it's going to come true. It appears that next year uh, there'll be a movie called The Last Pharaoh, you know, starring Will Smith. I can't quite see Will Smith as Taharka, as The Last Pharaoh, but I'd rather see him than Brad Pitt. He went to Jerusalem at least three times to save his Jewish allies. This is called the Taharka Gate. And this is a part of the entrance to Karnak Temple. Look at dim braids. Not dim braids, dim braids, that's what I call it. <laughs> this is in the Egyptian, I mean the uh, British Museum in London. Y'all still keep taking pictures now. There's no photography. No photography. Okay. Now, this is one that you probably haven't seen. And I don't quite know what to make of it. This is Cleopatra the Seventh. Now, I, you know, I, I've been trying to find, not too hard trying, to find some African lineage in Cleopatra, but I haven't been too successful. There was a report that came out several months ago, maybe a year ago, saying they found an African ancestor. But she looks, she looks pretty much like a sister right here. Uh, Cleopatra the Seventh is the last representative of what is called the Ptolemaic Dynasty. She reigned for about 20 years. She was certainly sympathetic to Africa at the very least. She identified with Africa. I even think of her as an African patriot. Of course, she had a relationship with Julius Caesar and Mark Antony. She had two children. Um, she committed suicide in, I think, 30 BC. And the Ptolemaic dynasty comes to an end. And uh, Kemet comes thirdly under Roman domination. And this is in the Louvre in Paris, an original. Now, this takes us out of Egypt. You've got to spend time with Egypt. You've got to spend time with Kemet. But it's not the totality of African civilization. And one of the criticisms that I get sometimes is that some of the African scholars, they tell us, the African-centered scholars, especially in the United States, spend too much time with Kemet. Now, there's uh, is reason we spend all that time with Kemet. But Kemet is not, and the Nile Valley is not the totality 
of the Afri of the ancient African experience. So let's explore some other parts of Africa uh, for a moment at least. This is from ancient Carthage. Carthage is in Tunisia. This is a photograph I took in a former palace which is now called the Bardo Museum. Carthage, of course, is a country that gave birth to the great Hannibal Barca, the original Hannibal. This is a beautiful piece. This is a mosque in Mali. This is a photograph of the Niger River. Ivan used to say, in fact, I think not just Ivan, but Ivan's mentor, a man named Jan Karu, used to say that if you want to understand Africa, you must understand Africa's highways. And Dr. Carew's contention was the highways were the rivers of Africa. The Nile, the Niger, the Limpopo, the Congo, the Zambezi. If you understood that, according to Dr. Carew, who was Ivan's mentor, mentor, you would have a better understanding of Africa itself. This is a photograph I took sailing on the Niger River a few years ago. The, Afri the English Africans call it the Niger River. The French Africans call it the River Niger. It has a very rich history, and as I was sailing on the river, I was uh, joined by a descendant of a man named Abubakar the Great, Abubakar II, who um, helped uh, establish a fleet of ships that sailed across the Atlantic more than 800 years ago. And I, this brother, you know, we were on the same boat, and he told me stories of his illustrious ancestor. Niger is a very poor country. You have one doctor in Niger for every 70,000 people. Unemployment is like 70%. The French have robbed and raped and pillaged, but they have a rich history. And it's one of the few African countries that I know of that starts their history from an African perspective. If you go to Ghana, they start teaching history from the time the Portuguese came in the 15th century. If you go to South Africa, they start teaching, although there's a 40,000 year history of people in, in South Africa, black people, Africans, they start teaching history from the time the Dutch came in 1652. They ignore the first 40,000 years. If you go to Uganda, one of my favorite countries in Africa, they began to talk about history beginning in the 19th century when the British came. But in Niger, they go back to the time of the Mali and Songhai empires. And this is a sister from Niger. Beautiful sister. This young brother, very, very shy, is a photograph I took in Tunisia. I've been in Tunisia once before. <laughs> I had quite an adventure there at the beginning of July this year. A lot of misadventures, as a matter of fact. I could write a book about all the things that went wrong, but I went in the deep south and I was able to find a whole bunch of black folk in the Sahara. And this is one of my favorite pictures. I'm trying to put together a nice calendar on images of African children. Oh, there's Renoko Rashidi uh, with this elder from uh, southern Tunisia. This is one of the few success stories of Afri um, an African success story in southern Tunisia. Black folk, needless to say, are very oppressed throughout the Saharan region. And you find, at least my experiences in North Africa, I've been blessed to go to Morocco a lot of times to Tunisia and many times to Kemet. I haven't been to Algeria, I haven't been to Libya yet. I'm trying to get there. But I find that black people in North Africa have been pushed into the South. Yes. And they have been very much abused. And so I was able to go into Southern Tunisia and talk to a lot of the people and hear their stories. And this brother really took a liking to me. And the reason um, I think he did is we started talking about Barack Obama. Now a lot of us put Barack Obama down. But African people all over the world hold him in high esteem. And they don't see him as the president of the United States. They see him as the president of the black world. This is a brother from Tunisia, all from the south, on the edge of the Sahara. I couldn't get any real precise figures about how many black people live. The government doesn't allow those figures to be publicized. They have a kind of a we are one attitude. Even talking about race in Tunisia can get you arrested. So it was very difficult to communicate with a lot of these sisters and brothers. And this was one of my most important destinations. This is a place called Kebele. And Kebele was, for lack of a better word, a slave market. And Africans were taken here from as far away as Senegal. They were marched even from West Africa across the Sahara into Tunisia 
at this market on the edge of the Sahara. And there they were sold to people of, from the Ottoman Turkish Empire. They were also sold to Europeans from Chad, from Mali, from Niger, and as far away as Senegal. And this is Kebele. It's a very strange place. At least it was the day I went there. There, was, I, there were no other people there. There was no sounds. The dogs weren't barking. The birds weren't chirping. The tree, the wind in the trees weren't even rustling. Or you couldn't even hear the leaves in the trees rustle. It was a very eerie silence as I toured this place. As I went to where the African women were kept. As I went to where the people were chained up. A very eerie silence. 